Good afternoon. This is the video that you will watch or you should watch for the Monday, January 18th lecture to replace the lecture that we would not have to do to MLK Day. Please remember that we will be having a lab at 1 p.m. here in Miller Hall 221. We left off with talking about how we perform or the reg or the <clears throat> what we do with digits that are measured values, values that you would obtain if you used a ruler or some other measuring tool. We said sig figs are important. The rules for multiplication and division are fewest digits total, fewest sig figs total. So in A, 10.70 has four sig figs, 3.5. We can only report that to two sig figs. 0 0.206 divided by 25,993. We only get three sig figs. <clears throat> 1,300 divided by 41.2. 1,300. How many sig figs is the decimal point explicitly stated or it is implied? Since we do not see a decimal point there, that means that it is implied to be, but not specifically stated. It's implied to be 1,300. So we only have two sig figs, the one and the three. Here we have three sig figs. So we could only report this answer to two significant digits. Looking at the math, it comes out to be 31.55. So one, two, one to the right, five or greater, yes. This rounds to 32. 12.05 times 0 0.0261. How many sig figs here? Four, why? Well, the one, the two, and the five are significant automatically. This zero, since it is sandwiched between the two and the five, is significant. So we have four sig figs here, this lead zero is not significant. It is important, and therefore it still needs to be there because it tells us the value is less than one. What about this zero? Is that zero significant? Yes, it is. This tells it that it is less than a tenth. We have a digit in the hundreds place. So we only have three sig figs. So we can only report this answer to three decimal points. So my math gives me 0 0.3145, three sig figs. Since this is not significant, we can't start here. This is the first digit in order of appearance, but it is not a significant digit. So one, two, three, one to the right. Is it five or greater? Yes. Drop it and, around, and round that next number up. 0.315. Excuse me. Eight. Addition and subtraction. We're looking here at total digits, not sig figs. You're looking for that value that has the fewest digits past the decimal point. We have one digit past the decimal point. 0 0.246, we have three. So we're limited here to one digit past the decimal point. 102.66, 0 0.857, and 24. Since, we, since there is nothing past the decimal point in 24, we can't report anything past the decimal point. So here it would be 120, let me see, 127, I think that would be rounded, 128. Let's see. So 54.6 minus 25. Again, are we reporting anything past the decimal point? No. So doing the math, 54.6 minus 25 rounds to 29.6. Two sig figs. Since this is our first sig fig, we look at this one. One to the right, five or greater, yes. 
Therefore, this rounds to 30 to tell us that we know exactly what this number is. We can write 30 point. That point tells us that that zero is known precisely. Therefore, we can put the decimal point. Therefore, that zero would be defined as significant. D22.35 minus 0.226. Here we only have two digits past the decimal point. There we have three. So we can only report this answer to three to two, two digits past the decimal point. The value that I get 2.084. So we can only report the answer to two digits past the decimal point. Do we have numbers that are in front of the decimal point? Yes. We bring those in as appropriate, but we're looking at the number of digits past the decimal point. One, two. One to the right. Five or greater? No. So this is 2.08. For my class, I have some rules that may differ from the way that other individuals have taught you. For my class, I want you to, when you are having different mixture operations of math, meaning multiplication and or division in combination with addition and subtraction. So in this problem, what do we have? We have subtraction and we have, and we have division. Since we're flipping over, since we're switching between the two different kinds of rules, well, do you just do fewest total past the decimal point? Or do you look at total sig figs? Because in this operation, you'd be looking at total sig figs. The division, you're looking at total sig figs. But this is subtraction. In subtraction, you're looking at what comes after the decimal point. So those are two different things. So when you do math, it's this mixture math, as I call it, you me too. This is what I want you to do. I want you to take a look at what value you're doing math with that has the fewest sig figs total. And then report your answer to no more than that. So for example, how many sig figs total? Three. How many sig figs total? Five. How many total? Three. So what I want you to do is Express this answer to no more than three total sig figs, independent of where the decimal point falls. So 68.7 divided by 14.021. Excuse me, 68.7 minus 14.021. In the rules of math, we work on this value first. So 14.02. 021 divided by 18.9 is 0 0.71474185. Then you subtract that value from 68.7. Multiplication and division happen first before you do addition and subtraction by the, by the regular order of algebraic rules of math. So 68.7 minus 0 0.74185. Again, fewest sig figs total of the values that you're doing math with. Three sig figs, five, three. So you can only report this answer to three total sig figs independent of where the decimal point falls. So it's 68.7 minus 0 0.74185. So we have 67. 0.98, excuse me, 67.95815. We can only express this to three, three sig figs. One, two, three. Here's our first one, second one, third one. One to the right. Five or greater? Yes. This five bumps up that to zero. That bumps up that to 8, so it is 68.0. In C, are we doing the mixture math? Yes, we are. 
we're doing a combination of multiple, excuse me, division and subtraction. So again, we're looking at that value that we're doing math with that has the fewest total sig figs. Here we have two, there we have three, there we have three. So we can only report this answer to two sig figs. Rules of math say that these inside parentheses are done first before anything else. So it's 15.7 minus 3.1. That is 12.6 divided by 0 0.317. So we, we are dividing this. This comes out to be 39,746. 7476, sorry. We're looking for three sig figs. One, two, three. One to the right. Sorry. Two sig figs, I'm sorry. One, two. One to the right. Five or greater? Yes. Therefore, 40 points. So keep in mind, rules for multiplication and division, fewest total sig figs. Rules for addition and subtraction, fewest digits past the decimal point. Not talking about sig figs, fewest digits past the decimal point. When you're doing the mixture math, mixtures of multiplication and or division combined with addition and or subtraction, then you use that value. You're looking at the math, and you're looking at that value that has the fewest sig figs in their total. How did I do this? No, I didn't do it. So if this was a multiplication instead of an addition sign, we're doing mixture math. So we take the fewest sig figs total. How many sig figs here? Three. How many sig figs here? One. How many sig figs there? Four. So since there is only one sig fig here, you would report this answer in the way that I want you to do it. You would report this to one digit only. So 12.3 times 0 0.06, add to that 53. Let's see, you're going to get something that's probably close to 53, which rounds to something about 50. Let's look at number 10. How do we write numbers in scientific notation? Scientific notation is expressed a digit between 1 and 10 and a times 10 to some power. Let's see, we take 602. See, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 19, 20, 21, 22. Let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. 6.022 times 10, 6, 602 times 10 to the 23rd. That's what that value is. 602, oh, good grief, obnoxiously large number. We're changing this number, an extraordinarily large number, to a compressed number. This digit part has to be between 1 and 10. So we start where the decimal point is. In this case, is the decimal point implied or specified? Is there a dot there? Did I write a dot there? No. So the decimal point there is implied. We move it to that position and in that direction such that we have only one non-zero number immediately to the left of the decimal point. So 
So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty one, twenty two. Okay, so it is six point oh two times ten to the number of places that I moved my decimal point. So I moved it 22 positions. So this value is 6.02 times 10 to the 22nd. Notice in this expression, how many sig figs did I include in this decimal portion? Three, sorry, three. Why? Because only the digits that are significant in our original number appear as part of this decimal portion. So we have the 6, the 0, and the 2 are significant. If there were other numbers here, then it would be 6.02, whatever those numbers are. But since these zeros are not significant because there was no decimal point here, we don't have to express them. Only digits that were significant in our original value are placed in this decimal portion. Notice, numbers that are larger than one have positive exponents. What do you think might be true for those, those values that are smaller than one? Their exponent is, and if you're screaming negative, 0.1 for you, or one point for you, sorry, I shouldn't say it. One point for you. So if we have, let's work an example. 93200. So we have a decimal point between nine and 10 times 10, some value. Well, where is the decimal point? Is it specific, stated, or is it implied? implied where it is implied to be right there so do we know that those two zeros are significant no we don't so what values what numbers do we include in our digit here the nine the three and the two since they're the only numbers that we know are significant we only include the nine the three and the two so if we move a decimal point to here so is 93.2 between 1 and 10? No, we need to move the decimal place one more point. So it is 9.32 times 10 to the number of places that we moved our, that we moved our decimal point. So it is 1, 2, 3, 4. 9.32 times 10 to the plus 4. 0.000725. And number B, are any of those zeros significant? The leading zeros, are they significant? No. Why? Well, because this first zero is not between two non zero numbers, two significant digits. So this first zero is not significant. Is it important? Yes. It tells us that the number is less than one. Are these two? Are these three zeros significant? No. Why? Because they are not sandwiched between two non-zero numbers. Are these zeros to the right of a decimal point? Yes, they are. But are they to the right of a non-zero number? No, they're not. So these zeros are not significant. So the only thing that appears in our decimal point is the 725. Where is the decimal point? Implied or specified? Here it is specified exactly. Specified to be here. But what digits are significant? The 7, the 2, and the 5. So if we move the decimal point to here, we move the decimal point two places. But then is 0 0.0725, is that between 1 and 10? No, we need to keep moving a decimal point. Well, what if we move it there? Well, is 0 0.725 between 1 and 10? No, it's not. 
we need to move that decimal point right there. So it is 7.25 times 10 to the negative number of places that we moved the decimal point. So we moved it 1, 2, 3, 4, 7.25 times 10 to the minus 4. What about 6, 7, 8, 0, 0, 0, 0? Again, is the decimal point implied or specifically stated? Well, do we see a dot there? No. It means that the decimal point is implied. So we don't know about these zeros. We don't know if they're significant. We can't tell. The only thing that you can specifically clearly identify as significant is 678. So let's write 678. Those are the only significant digits that we're absolutely sure of in this number. The decimal point is implied to be there. So we want to move it so, the, so it is represented in a decimal portion that is between 1 and 10. Well, if we move it there between the 8 and 0, is 678 between 1 and 10? No. We move it, is 60 set? No. We have to move it right there, 6.78. So it is 6.78 times 10 to the number of places that we moved our decimal point. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 6.78 times 10 to the minus 6. What about E? The decimal point specifically stated or implied? Just specifically stated. Where is it stated to be? Zero. Right there. Implied to be right there. Because there is a leading zero, it tells us that the, the initial value was less than one. Therefore, the exponents are going to be negative. How many sig figs do we have? Well, 3, the 7, the 1, and the 5 are significant automatically. Is that zero significant? Yes, it is. Why? Well, significant twice over, it doesn't mean it's doubly significant, but it's, it satisfied the two rules, two separate distinct rules for determining if it's significant. One, it's sandwiched between two non-zero numbers. The other is that, is this zero to the right of a decimal point? Yes. Is it to the right of a non-zero number? Yes. So by definition, that, that, de that number must appear in the decimal portion of your scientific notation. There's a decimal point. It's specified. One, two, three, four. So is 3.7015 between 1 and 10? Yes. So it is 3.7015. Excuse me. Sorry. Three point zero three point seven zero one five, the three to seven, the zero and the one to five, are all significant digits in our original number. Therefore, they appear in our decimal part times the number of positions we move the decimal point. Is our number initially smaller than one? Yes. Therefore, the exponent is negative. Negative one, two, three, four. So 3.705 times 10 to the minus 4. I know that you know you can anticipate where we're going next. If, we're, if you're given numbers in what we call standard notation, that's the decimal format. This is what we call standard notation. You've changed those numbers into scientific notation. Guess what? You're going to have to change numbers from scientific notation back to standard notation. You're going to have to know how to do that. Write each number in standard notation. First thing you do, look at the exponent. Is this exponent positive? Yes. Then what does it mean? It means the number was initially larger than 1, 
and you're going to be moving the decimal point to the right. Well, how many positions to the right? Three positions to the right. Since you're moving a decimal point in the order of numbers, you have to have something placeholders there to indicate that the number is at least that large or larger. So let me see. 6.5, and we have to be able to move that decimal point one, two, three places. But remember, this value says that the only significant digits in our number were the six and the five. Well, of our cardinal digits, which is the only one that we can use that does not have any significance immediately associated with it. It's the zero. So if we write six, five, zero, zero, let's look. Is the decimal point implicit or is it implied? Well, it's implied. Where is it implied to be? Here. One, two, three. Since these zeros are by definition, if we write it that way, are not significant, they act as placeholders to show us how large or small that number is. But these are not by definition significant. So this is 6,500. thousand five hundred. What about this? 3.26 times 10 to the minus 5. Okay, look at the exponent. What is it? Positive or negative? It's negative. It means that your number, your number in your standard notation is less than 1. Well, because this number is minus 5, it tells us it is significantly less than 1. So let's write 3, let's write this 3 to 6. It says that there, because this value is negative, it tells us that there's zeros in front of this 3 to 6. Well, we had to move it five positions. That means the fourth position, there was a zero here, and the fifth one was to move it between the 3 and the 2. So that tells us there had to be four zeros in front of it. One, two, three, four, five. So in this original number, zero point zero 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 three two six. The three and the two and the six are the only digits that are significant here. Therefore, there are the only digits that appear as part of this decimal number. 104 times 10 to the 8th. Exponent is positive. Tells us that the number was larger than 1, so we're going to move the decimal point to the right. How many places? A lot of places to the right. So at least we're going to be moving it two positions because the 1, the 0, and the 4 are significant automatically. We need to move it at least two positions but then after that, we have to add other numbers there that don't add significance to this value because only the one, the zero, and the four are significant. So the only digit that we can add in that doesn't immediately add significance to them are zeros. How many zeros? Well, we move this one, two, we have to add six more zeros onto that. One. Two, three, four, five, six. So do we write it this way or one zero four zero 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 and see? Eight. Or do we write it or do we write it that way, no decimal point? Well, remember, if we add the decimal point, it means that all these zeros are significant and they need to be included in this, digital this decimal portion. 
since the only of the one and the zero and the four are significant? We write it like this, no decimal point. So, 104 million. So you're going to have to know and be very familiar with being able to, to convert these things back and forth, standard to scientific, scientific to standard. We can use what I call fractional friends. Friends are people that help you get down the road to solve your problems. Fractional friends are those things that you can create to help you get down the road to score points on the exam. We can work into this or show this by starting with a simple illustration. One foot is equal to 12 inches. By definition, that's the reality. What happens if we divide both sides, remember, in math, if we divide one side by one thing, we have to divide the other side by that same thing, too, to keep this equality accurate. So if we divide both sides by one foot, this results or resolves to one. Okay. Have I done anything that is not allowed by math? No. If I divided this side by, the, that, by this one, I divided that side by it too, as required by the laws of math. So this results to one, so we have 12 foot, excuse me, 12 inches over one foot. Okay? Notice. What if I divide this same starting equation, one foot for 12 inches, what if I divide both sides by 12 inches? Aren't I doing the same thing that I did down here? Yes, same principle is applied. I'm dividing both sides by the same thing. What is this simplified to? It says one foot is e over 12 inches is equal to one. Well, if I have one foot over 12 inches is equal to 1, and 12 inches over 1 foot is equal to 1. A is equal to B, C is equal to B. If A is equal to B and C is equal to B, B and B are equal to one another, A is equal to C. What does this mean? This means that 1 foot over 12 inches is exactly the same, it means the exact same thing as 12 inches over one foot. These are what I call fractional friends. So given any equality, A is equal to B, you can create two sets of fractional friends. A over B or B over A. These are essentially saying, when you use that same mathematical derivation, that A over B is equal to B over A. So, given any equality, you can create two sets of fractional friends. Well, why are these things valuable? Well, some of you may be already be able to see this in your mind. Others, let's take a look. Let's say you have 3.75 feet, and you want to know how many inches that is. Well, what do we already know about this? We know that 12 inches is one foot. So if we want to go from feet to inches, 3.75 feet... Is that okay? If I write 3.75 over 1, am I violating any rule of math? No. 3.75 divided by 1 is 3.75. I'm not changing this number at all. I'm just dividing it by 1. 
any value divided by one is that same value back. I'm just choosing to express this value differently. Well, what remember? We have two sets of fractional friends. 12 inches over one foot and one foot over 12 inches. Now, what are we wanting? What are the units that we're wanting here? We're wanting it in inches. Well, let me see. If we write one foot over 12 inches and we multiply that out, you get 3.75 feet squared over 12 inches. But is that what we is that what we want? Do we want feet squared over inches? No, we just want inches. Well, what? So we can't use this one. Well, let's stick let's let's stick that one in there and let's see what that does for us. Twelve inches over one foot. Oh, hey, hey, we have feet on the top and feet on the bottom. What can we do when we have similar terms, top and bottom? Don't they cancel, air quotes, cancel one another out? So if we look at just the units, feet on the bottom, is canceled out by feet on the top. What units are you left with? Well, feet is canceled out. You're left with units of inches. What did the question ask you? Inches. So now all you need to do is 3.75 times 12, and you should get your answer. So this is the value of our fractional friends. You can change from one unit to another just given any equality. You can create two fractional friends. Usually in class I scream and I yell when I do this part of the presentation, but it's not going to have the same impact because you're not here. Okay, 25 liters to deciliters. Well, what have I provided out here? Really, this is 10 deciliters is equal to one liter. Isn't that an equality? Yeah, it is. This is equal to that. Two fractional friends. 10 deciliter over one liter or one liter over 10 deciliters. What form of our fractional friend do we have? Well, where are we starting at? We have 25 liters, and we want to convert that to deciliters. Well, what if I do this? Is 25 over 1 is the same thing as 25? Is dividing 25 by 1 give us any different value than what I started with? No. Then writing it 25 over 1 is fine. What if we have 10 deciliters per 1 liter, or the inverse of this, 1 liter per 10 deciliters? Well, what form of our fractional friend gets you down the road to score points on the exam? Here, we have deciliters on top and liters on the bottom, or do we want to flip it? Well, if we write this, DE, CI liters, over one liter, look at the units only. Leaders on the bottom, cancel leaders on the top. What units are we left with? Deciliters. So we have 25 times 10, 250 deciliters. All 
right? Let's try B, 40 ounces to grams. So this is 250 deciliters. Two fifty deciliters. One gram is equal to twenty eight point three ounces. So we can have one point zero zero grams to twenty eight point three ounces or twenty eight point three ounces to one point zero zero grams. Any equality, we can express it as these two fractional friends. Well, where are you at? You're starting out with units of ounces. You want to go to units of grams. So start out with what you know. What do you know? You know you have 40 ounces. So 40.0 ounces Again, can I write that 40.0 over 1? Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not doing anything wrong. 40 divided by 1 is still 40. So we have these two fractional friends. Which fractional friend do we want that have the units in the right, or would put the units in the right above, below position, to change from ounces to grams. So we have 1.00 grams to 28.3 ounces. So if we look at just the units, ounces above cancel, ounces below. So we have 40 divided by 28.3. Sig figs in math. What kind of math are we doing? Multiplication and or division. Same rules. Fewest total sig figs. 40.0, 1.00, 28.3. So we can only express this to three sig figs. This is 1.41 grams. Centimeters to millimeters. Given the equality, 10 millimeters is equal to 1 centimeter. Two fractional friends, 10 millimeters over 1 centimeter or 1 centimeter to 10 millimeters. Well, where, where do we start? We start out in centimeters, so 10 centimeters. Again, can I write that over 1? 10 divided by 1 is still 10. Yes, I can write it like that. Well, what form of our fractional friend do we use? Well, we want to go from centimeters to millimeters. So we're going to want to put that form of our fractional friend right there where the centimeters cancel, leaving millimeters only one centimeter, 10 millimeters, centimeters above. Looking at the units alone, not the numbers, the units alone, centimeters, centimeters cancel. What are you left with? Millimeters. So 10 times 10 is 100 millimeters. All right, I'll leave C to do on your own. Let's look at 13. It says carry out the following conversions. How many seconds are there in 2.75 years? What's the point of this problem? This is a what is called a factor label conversion marathon. This is to show you that you can not only use single conversion units, but you can you can create a sequence of conversion factors that will walk you 
from unit to unit to unit to unit until you end in your right unit. So 2.75 years. So one year is 365 days. One day is 24 hours. One hour is 60 minutes. Six, let me see. One minute is 60 seconds. Or you can go month, week, however you want to do it. Okay, these are the conversion factors that I've chosen to use. So where do we start out at? 2.75 years. Over one. Again, 2.75 divided by one is still 2.75. So now we're going off that first conversion. One year is 365 days. So we want years to drop out, so we write 365 days for one year. Next conversion between day and hours. We want days to drop out, therefore days is on the bottom. 24 hours, one day. Next conversion, we're going from hours to minutes. Hours are on top, we want hours on the bottom here. One hour, 60 minutes. Last one, we want to go from minutes You want to go to seconds. So minutes is on the top, you want minutes on the bottom. Now, if we've done this correct, the top bottom cancellation of a units should go across and we should end up in the right units. And if you're ending up in the right units, 95 to 97% of the time, you're going to get the right answer. The only exception is if you miss press a button on your calculator or you have fat fingers like I do that can press more than one button at the same time. So what you do, years above, years below. Days above, day below. Hours above, hours below. Minutes above, minutes below. What unit are you left with? Seconds. What does the question ask? Seconds. So all that's left now is to multiply 2.75 times 365 times 24 times 60 times 60 divided by 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. And I get something close to 8.6 times 10 to the seventh second. You can stick quite a number of these conversion factors next to one another in sequence. And as long as you're coming out in the right units, again, 95 to 97% of the time, you're going to come up with the right answer almost for points completely. Consider is make sure you're doing your math correctly. Make sure you're hitting multiply and all the other things correctly. You should get the right answer. Okay, number B, how fast in miles per hour is 62.0 kilometers per one minute? Now let's, let, wait a minute, let's, let's just stop here just a second. Sometimes the biggest problem students have in figuring out how to answer a problem is how do I approach it? What information is the problem giving me? Sometimes it's like, I, I don't know even how to approach this. One of the ways that I encourage you is to identify pieces of information that you have provided in your word problem. Well, what's informa what information do we have? Well, it says, how fast in miles per hour? So this is technically miles over hour, miles per hour. Per means divided. So these are the units you want your answer in. If you're traveling 62 kilometers per one minute, 
So 62 kilometers per one minute really means 62 kilometers over 1.00 minutes. That's what that 62.00 kilometers per hour really per minute means, per one minute. Well, okay, well, how does that help me? Well, if you know the conversion factor between miles and kilometers, you're really set because you really ought to know the conversions between hours and minutes. Well, it says 60, let me see, how fast in miles per hour, okay, is 62 kilometers per one minute. So where is our starting point? What numbers do we have to start with? 62 kilometers per one minute. Okay, well, let's work this problem starting out with something we're familiar with. 62 kilometers per 1.00 minutes. We already know that there are 60 minutes in one hour. But we want the minutes to cancel so we end up in hours. So if we say 60 minutes per one hour, or let's write this as 60.0 minutes per one hour. Well, right now, if we do the cancellation, minutes below, minutes above, aren't you already in your denominator at the right units? Yeah. So it's 62 times 60. This will give you a term in terms of kilometers per hour. You're already in the hour units of time. The only thing we don't know, or I haven't provided you yet, is a conversion factor that relates kilometers to miles. Let me see. In the, where is it? Very back of your textbook. Not quite sure that you can see it. Not really quite sure I'm doing it justice. On the very back cover. It's in the middle block. It says useful conversion factors. It says that one kilometer is 0 0.621 miles. So let us write this as 1.00 km is 0 0.621 miles. What do we have? We have an equality. Any equality can be used to create two fractional friends, kilometers per miles or miles per kilometer. Well, what way do we want our fractional friend to be expressed? Here, kilometers is in the top. We, want, we don't want kilometers, we want miles. So if kilometers is where we're starting out, we want this conversion part of the kilometer in the bottom. So we want 0.00 kilometers, 0 0.621 miles. So minutes are to hours. Kilometers cancel. So we are now in units of miles per hour. Isn't that the units that we wanted right here? Yeah, it is. So it is 62 times 60 times 0.621. Two, three, one, zero miles per hour. So there we go. Again. We can use fractional friends to allow us to convert 
all within the same unit, like we did with years to seconds. Or we can have two different units that are not related to one another. Kilometers is a distance unit. Minutes is a time-based unit. But here, we have them expressed in relationship to one another. For every one minute we drive, we, could, we cover 62 kilometers. These are unrelated to one another. This is a distance unit. This is a time unit. But by using the right set of fractional friends, we can convert between the various kinds of time units and distance units given the appropriate conversion factors. You will be needing to have the conversions between all the metric units, the kilometers, decimeters, centimeters, millimeters, nano, micro, pico, femto, atto, however, down small, and those that are more than one. Deca, kilo, mega, giga, tera. Those are all the conversion factors that you're going to need to know. So, name of the, of the abbreviation, the symbol, and the power of 10. So, let's work out real quick. Let's say I give you the name... Centi. The symbol for centi is C. The power of 10 is 10 to the minus 2. If I give you G for giga, the name for the symbol is giga. The power of 10 is 10 to the ninth. Okay? So you're going to need to know for each value, the name, the symbol, the power of 10. And you're going to need to know how to apply those. You're going to need to know conversions between base units. Base unit of a meter, given a specific value for meters, change it to centimeters. Or a value in base units of centimeters, change, change that to meters. So those within that SI meter basic unit, you're going to need to know how to do that. The values that I expect you to come in memorized are those that convert between the metric meters and the English system. Inches, feet, yards, furlongs. Can't remember what the other. I can't remember what the other. Um, what the other distance unit is? Yards. Let's see, inches, feet, yards, miles. I think there's a different. I think there's a distance of a furlong or something like that. But those English systems, you do not have to memorize. I will provide you a conversion factor of the conversions from the English to the metric or the metric to the English. What you're going to have to come in knowing how to do is convert within the metric system within a base unit. Changing your temperature. You will be provided the formulas on a help sheet for the exam. So you're not going to have to have this memorized. It would be beneficial for you to have these things memorized or at least what temperatures correspond to other temperatures on other temperature scales. We have been on, in process of trying to convert from the English system of measurement, feet, miles, in distance, um, quarts, pints, gallons, to liters of the, of the SI unit system. We've been trying to convert into those for a long time. That conversion is slow in coming. But one of those that has been converted 
quickly or fairly well is the Fahrenheit to Celsius scale. Temperature in Celsius is, cel excuse me, the SI unit is in a unit that's related to Celsius. But Celsius is an SI based unit. You will be given the formulas to change from Fahrenheit to Celsius, Celsius to Fahrenheit, and the SI unit of temperature is Kelvin. So you're going to be given those formulas. So change the temperature to provide the indicated temperatures. You're at 20 degrees C. You want it in Fahrenheit. So the change of temperature between Fahrenheit and Celsius is 1.8 times the temperature in Celsius plus 32. So in this equation, the temperature in Fahrenheit of a temperature 20 degrees C, so you have 1.8 times 20 plus 32. Is this mixture math? Yes, it is. What do I want you to do? I want you to express this answer to that value that is the least number of sig figs. How many sig figs here? One. How many sig figs here? Two. How many sig figs there? Two. So technically, this will be only expressible to one decimal point, to one, one digit. So you do this first because this is multiplication. This is in parentheses. So it's 1.8 times 20 plus 32 comes up to be something like 68 degrees Fahrenheit or, rounding to one sig figs, 70 degrees. In B, you're converting Fahrenheit to Celsius. Temperature in Celsius is temperature Fahrenheit minus 32 divided by 1.8. Just a manipulation of this equation. T sub C is 150 point minus 32, all that divided by 1.8. Thirty-two. We know the decimal point is right there. We are absolutely certain that there is no value that we have any information about after the two. It's thirty-two point. Do we have any digits past the decimal point here? No. Do we have any digits past the decimal point there? No. So we can't report anything here if we were just looking at this subtraction. We couldn't report any value past the decimal point. But are we doing just subtraction alone? No. We're doing division also. So we're looking at that original value that has the fewest sig figs total. There's three sig figs there, two there, two there. So we can only report this to two sig figs. I come up with 66 degrees C. We're about done. This video has been a little bit longer than I thought. Kelvin from Celsius. To convert a temperature from Kelvin, excuse me, from Celsius to Kelvin, you just simply add 273 to it. So this is 273 plus 75.0 degrees C. Do we have any digits past the decimal point here? No. So when we add these together, we cannot report anything past the, can't re, we can't report anything to that one digit past the decimal point. No digits past the decimal point. Even though that we know that this value is zero, we can't report it because this, this value is not reported to that same level of precision. So we have basically 273 plus 75, uh, 348, 348 degrees Kelvin. So again, converting temperatures, you're going to be provided these values. When you're doing temperature conversions, because of the way that I have told you to do conversions when you're doing mixtures of math, be very careful with the number of sig figs that you report here. Last problem. Woohoo!
Density problems. Density is expressed in terms of grams per ml. Well, let's look at this. What is unique about this? Well, gram is a mass term. ML is a volume term. Mass and volume are related to one another, but not in the base units themselves. A mass term has little to no re relevance to a volume term unless you have some other additional information. We have that relationship what the, last, what the mass and the volume is in the value of density. Density is equal to, density, big D, is equal to mass divided by volume. There is what is known as the, excuse me, density magic triangle. M over dB. If you use this magic density triangle 99% of the time, you're going to come up with the right answer. The way you use this is whatever number or variable they're asking you to, can to calculate, you cover that value up. Whatever math is left over, that's what you do. For example, what is the mass? So what are we looking for? M in grams in 10 ml of diethyl ether with an anesthetic that has a density of 0 0.713 grams per ml. Well, here's our magic density triangle. What are we looking for? Mass. Cover it up. What do you have left? Density times volume. Well, do we have a density of this? Yes. It's 0 0.713 grams per ml. Well, do we have a volume? Yes, 10 ml. So we multiply 0 0.713 grams per 1 ml times 10 ml. Well, well, just to make sure we can keep the above below relationship clear, why don't I write this over 1? Is 10 divided by 1 the same thing as 10? Yeah, same thing. So I'm not expressing this any other inappropriate way. Let me see. I think I might, might be in a blind spot. Grams per 1.00 ml. 10.0 ml over 1. How about that? I don't think we're in a blind spot anymore. ML units cancel. What are we left with? Grams. What does the problem ask for? Grams. So we have 0 0.713 times 10. So that is 7.13 grams. What if we wanted volume? We'll cover volume. The magic density triangle. What do you have? Mass divided by density. So that's the value of the magic density triangle. Okay, what is the identity? What is the material in the upper layer when we have these two mixed together? Olive oil and water. Water, by definition, has a density of one. One gram per one ml. Olive oil has a density of 0.92 grams per ml. So if this is our container, there is the mix of the two liquids. Is the oil going to be on top and the water on the bottom? Or the water on the top and oil going to be on the bottom? What do you think? Well, if you put cooking oils like mazola or vegetable oil or canola oil or coconut oil in water, what, la what layer is on top? It's usually the oil. These oils, these vegetable oils, 
are usually have densities less than one. So things that are less dense than others are on top. So in this specific example, we have the olive oil on top and the water below. Water has a density of one gram per 1.0 ml. The olive oil has a density of 0 0.92 grams per 1.00 ml. Last problem, 15B. Woohoo! One problem away from having a good weekend. Chloroform, density of 1.49. Again, the, weight, the density of water is 1. Chloroform, the density is 1.449. Excuse me, 1.49. Chloroform is more dense than water. So in this case, there's a surface of our liquid. There's, there's the two liquids. Water is on top. And your chloroform is on the bottom. Water is less dense, has a value of 1. Chloroform is more dense, it has a value of 1.49. So those things that are less dense than others are on top. Those things that are more dense are on the bottom. That is the end of the Chapter 1 Flip Fletcher Problems. You should have watched this video before you come to the first lab because you're supposed to have watched this on late on um, ml king day i will see you guys on monday at 1 p.m in miller hall 205 if you have any questions please do not hesitate to send me an email i will do the best job that i can getting back to you have a good weekend stay warm stay safe bye-bye